Monday, June 20th. Welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk, brought to you by my podcast network, CactusRadioNetwork.com. You can find all of my podcasts in one spot for absolutely free. At Home with Byron Katie, Dark Fonzie, The Grail, and Let There Be Talk at CactusRadioNetwork.com. Let's get into it. Let's see here. We are on an episode, an episode. We are way up there in episodes today. 652. That's where we're at today. And I got to tell you, man, it, uh, the pod, by the way, the podcast is a little late. Sorry. I was on the road for the last four days bouncing around time zones and it caught up to me. I was just exhausted, got home and I was like, fuck, I can't, I can't do nothing. I just got to lay down. I was out with Bill Burr and we were in uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and we went up to Bethel, New York, where the historic Woodstock concert took place. And we did shows in all these venues, but to be at that historic Bethel, New York, and to see that meadow, that beautiful grass bowl where the three days of uh, peace, love, and whatever it was went down. The, the concert that I often say, if there's a time machine, I immediately go back to Woodstock. I don't care. That's where I'd go. The greatest music festival ever. And uh, I stand by that. And I'll talk more about it on my patreon.com slash Dean Delray bonus episode. I have a Patreon and I do a lot of bonus episodes. There's over a hundred and something on there. And I Zoom with uh, the Patreoners each week. So I'll be talking about Woodstock and a bunch of other stuff this week at the, at the bonus episode. But anyway, back to what I was saying, I was uh, just torched. I was fucking tired. It, it catches up to you. I'm like, ooh, yeah, I'm fucking tired. <laughs> Got lucky. No, uh, no canceled flights on the way home. On the way there, man, the old, uh, we have a, uh, an air sensor we need to change on the plane. And it should be only about 15 minutes. And of course, it was not fucking 15 minutes. It was seven hours. And I flew into Allentown, got a little bit of sleep, then jumped in the car with Burr and and Club Soda Kenny. Drove out to Pennsylvania. Incredible audiences. Then did the Bethel, New York, and then New Jersey, PNC Art Center, the great Joey Diaz joined us. So great to see him. He uh, he did a set. What a surprise. Surprised the fans out there. Just they went crazy. And Bill killed the entire weekend, of course. Bill's new special is going to be coming out, I believe, in July. So look for that. Shot at Red Rocks. So that's, uh, that's going to be a very special one. I was uh, there when he shot the special. And uh, it is killer i'll tell you that right now speaking of killer i have a legend on the show today and it was an honor to talk to this man i've been listening to the brian jonestown massacre since the 90s living in san francisco it was the soundtrack of every bar you went into i've often said it a lot of times you go into a bar and you'd hear like in the jukebox you would catch like uh, curtis mayfield Then Tool would come on, and then some Brian Jonestown Massacre. And that seemed to be like the music everywhere in the 90s of San Francisco. And it really resonated with me. And I learned a lot from this man. My guest today is Anton, who is, he's a lifer, man. 19 records out. The Brian Jonestown Massacre has been together since 1990. This guy has more passion the 99% of the people out in the world doing music and art. He's the real deal. He'll, he'll say it exactly how it is. And a lot of times you might pay the price for that. But the audience is there. He's grown this thing into a uh, massive art colony, I would call it. Traveling around, selling out theaters, 
which is great to see in a, a, a packed house of people that are into great music. So funny. I posted who I had coming up on the show and some guy commented on Instagram. He was like, man, I'm trying to hang in there with these unknowns, but you know, referring to the podcast and I was like, I fucking, what are you, what are you afraid to learn? First of all, unknown, that's on your part because you don't seek past the five bands you probably listen to. But who doesn't want to constantly learn? That's what part of this show's about. If you've never heard of the Brian Jonestown Massacre, I'm not going to knock you on it. It's never too late to learn. But don't sit there. I mean, fuck, last week was John Doe from X. Oh, there's another unknown. Unknown to you. Because you probably listen to the FM radio and the eight bands they play a day. And it's just insane to me that somebody... Uh, uh, you know, like chastising me of like, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not going to stick around this podcast unless you have superstars. What a fucking, that's just, that's small. That is small. And, you know, the Brian Jonestown Massacre, Anton is right where I would love to be. Just a, uh, just a, a group of people that love great art and you could support yourself for life never getting too giant, never being completely obscure, and just having like cool people come out to the shows. That's the ultimate career. This guy is, this guy's been doing it, man, to say the least. He's got more records out than most people that are in the biz. 19 records? Come on. Got a new record coming out here real soon. When is that coming out? I got it right here. Fuck. There it is, June 24th. Oh, God, it's really good, too. The new record. I dig it. He says he's got two records coming out. He's like, yeah, I got one coming out, and then I'm going to drop another one. So <laughs> it's just, just going for it. He's living out in Berlin. We talked about what it's like to live in Berlin. We talk about the old days of San Francisco, uh, a lot of desert talk, punk rock, and, uh, and life. It was an honor to talk to him, man. It was an honor to talk to this guy. I, I definitely look up to his, uh, his grind and the never quit, never stop. Do it because you love it. And that's the bottom line. You do it because you love it. Yeah, I want more people to know who I am, but that's only so I can keep doing it. With music, you can just keep doing it. You just do it and you put it out on Spotify. And, but with comedy... If you don't get booked, you can't just record a comedy record at your house. I mean, you could, but I, I don't know if it's going to be any good. You got to you gotta be out there with the audience. That's what it's about. So uh, that's the only reason I ever hope to uh, keep going up in notches or whatever you would say. But uh, anyway, great, great episode. Uh, I'll see you guys this week. I'm going to be in Portland with Bill Burr on Thursday. Then Friday, I'm up in Washington. And then we go to Vancouver and Calgary. They're all on DeanDelRay.com, all the tour dates. Most important, I am headlining a couple shows in July. Two it, in Austin at the Vulcan Gas Company, July 9th. Two shows, one night. Please get tickets and spread the word. And then July 15 and 16, I'm out in Fort Collins, Colorado, doing the comedy for it. These are really important shows to me because, you know, these club bookers, they talk, man. They're like, how'd Dean do? Oh, he did okay, you know. But if you, uh, you tell all your friends, and, you, and even if you're not in Austin or Fort Collins, tweet it. You listen to this show, tweet out, hey, people of the world go see Dean Del Rey out on the road somewhere. That's how it happens. Word of mouth. That is how it happens. It was great. I got to be uh, back in New York. Uh, spent the night in New York the whole day before we did Jersey, Bill and I. And I finally got to go over and see Standard and Strange's new New York store over on uh, Mulberry, Lower East Side. Oh, my 
God, they killed it with the location. I was so excited to go to the store because I love these guys, Jeremy and Neil, and I wanted to see the new store. And I walked up and I was just blown away by how kick-ass this store was. I don't know if you remember, I had them on the show a while ago, but just two clothing freaks like myself, just loving high-end handmade goods. And I opened the door and it was uh, way bigger to me, it felt like, than their Berkeley slash Oakland store. It was just beautiful. And in the and and New York was just booming. Last time I was in New York, it was real grim, man. In November or December, it was dark times. Uh, the Delta was kicking in. People were still getting sick. There were a lot of junkies out. It looked like old New York from the '80s. But man, New York was alive, and it felt so good. I was like, oh, I love this energy. Just walking around the Lower East Side and. And, and man, I went into the store. They had like a thousand pair of boots. It was just boot mania. And then they had every great leather jacket ever. Tons of kick-ass denim. This store, this is the one-stop shop. Standard and strange in New York. Go there or hit their website or their Instagram. Tell them I sent you, man. They, they are doing it right. They have all the real McCoy stuff, which is my favorite. They got all the Y2 leather stuff. They have all of the great denim brands. I love Momotaro, and they carry it. And then just, just great people. So if you're in New York or the Bay Area, but New York, go see the New York store. I'm planning to uh, do a comedy show in there over the summer. Going to do some stand-up in there and have a little uh, gig and uh, have some fun there. So... Great to see you guys out there. And it was great to see a lot of uh, laughing faces in these arenas. It's, uh, it's been an interesting uh, learning curve of doing arenas. I love it, but some of them sound weird. Some of them, the people are still coming in. So there's all kinds of obstacles, and I'm figuring it out, and I'm loving it. The, uh, the education I'm getting. And thank you, Bill, for having me on this historic tour, man. It's just unreal. Because you know, I've been having these big ups and downs in, in moods and, and, and depression and career and stuff. I'm just kind of like, oh, what is going on? And uh, it just feels good to be out there telling jokes. All right. Let's get into it. Uh, if, you, if you want to ask me where you would start with the Brian Jonestown Massacre, I would say just open up iTunes and just pick a record, all right? I'm not going to sit here and say you should do this one or that because some are very different, and I like some of the more obscure ones. So just pick a record and, and, and then go from there, man. Just enjoy the ride. You're going to thank me later. I know you are. Okay, here we go. Episode number 652, The Candles Are Lit, Anton and the Brian Jonestown Massacre are here today. How are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm all right. It's a lovely day in Berlin. Get my glasses on. You live in Berlin? Yeah. Do you live in the high desert or is that just your backdrop? Well, that's my, uh, that's my inspiration when I'm talking to, talking to you, you know, that's where the music takes me a lot of times. I spent a lot of time out there, um, as a youngin, um, my family had a house out in 29 Palms in the high desert. Oh yeah, I know it. Military town. Yeah, but also, you know, um, it's interesting because the base actually surrounds the whole area. So you're around, you, you actually drive into the middle of it because they do the maneuvers all the way through the mountains and everything. But then there's, there were land grants in the, in the, basically around the time I was born, they just said, plop down 500 and you can just buy a plot, you know? And yeah. People just build, build all those cabins out there. Homestead cabins. Yeah, so I used to uh, we used to have a place out on uh, Giant Rock Road, which is really it was really interesting. 
you know, I had a lot of space growing up. I didn't live there. I mean, you know. It's just kind of like a, a magic spot, you know? It really is. Full of holes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of interesting, you know, um, we had doom buggies and surplus army jeep and uh, just guns and all that kind of stuff all kinds of motorcycles and um and i would just go off into an infinity the sand dunes and the dry lake beds and you could just go for miles i used to just blow down the main highway and walk into a store with a rifle in the back when i was a kid to just be like no shirt and just i mean it was a different time but uh, really interesting. I, I, I enjoyed it. Did you ever get into that uh, whole desert scene out there of like Caius and the generator parties and stuff like that? Well, you know, when I was uh, when I was also younger, you know, bands like Savage Republic and all these people would go out and I forget who would put on these parties, but they used to pile people into buses, you know, in L.A. and Orange County. Yeah. And just go out and watch punk bands, you know, at sunset, and just getting bananas out there. But all of these really, really far out bands would play you know for a while i guess, I guess it was it was in, in the 80s more than like the early 70s or the earlier because it was so hard to pull, pull off real shows of any you know there was a time where like fenders ballroom and all that stuff oh yeah all these all these different even the hong kong cafe it got to a point where anything decent was happening. The police were just piling in, blocking off all the roads and just beating people up. It got, it got so bananas in California. During like that fear era, you know? But even watching the dead Kennedys, you know, they kind of just like blocked all the doors and everybody's trapped in this. I don't know what it was. It was some kind of community center, maybe a Ukrainian culture center or some crap, right? And, you know, and I just remember like the cops and all this shit going on down outside. And everybody's watching these bands. And all of a sudden, the doors come open, and, and it's just riot police shooting tear gas and busting people. You know, in a full, a, a, a just insanity. You know, but um, it was it was interesting growing up. It was it was it was uh, exciting. Are you from Newport <laughs> Beach? Yeah, that's wild. I never knew that uh, because to me, uh, you know, uh, to me, uh, and I will tell you the history of me with the. Brian Jonestown is, mm -hmm. uh, grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco. A and it's really, to me. When I first moved to uh, San Francisco, my first place was like that converted grandma at 39th and Judah. Oh, wow. Did you ride the end Judah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Spent a lot of time right, right past uh, Anton LaVey's little black pad when you yeah. come out of the tunnel. <laughs> go, go on though. I was just talking about that. Like that was the, the satanic church and it was black. And now like families, it's hip to have a black house. But when I was growing up, that meant Satan. Yeah. But San Francisco has a tradition of, um, you know, a lot of interesting, not just the Bohemians, but especially in the Castro in different places where people really took the Victorian thing a step farther as far as the paint jobs which really looked cool just the different colors and gold trim and just like the purples and just just getting out there but i mean it, it, even you know like people don't know the hate ashbury was that was a gentrification project you know that that was actually where it used to be really nice big houses for these people with some some kind of business bread up on the hill not like fantastic rich but you know maybe managers or something their families or whatever and people with some money it was it was all black neighborhood and then so by the early 60s you know they just completely the owners of those places gentrified that stuff so that's what brought all the bands being able to rent those flats and people just you know by the bucket full but um a lot of those places were all painted wacky too yeah. you know yeah. and i always loved it you know living over here in europe everything's so white i mean you, you have to everybody rents everything so but you know like all the houses are white, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Inside it, everything's just so like, people don't really make that leap. I mean, they sell some colored stuff, but you know, I painted the inside of my studio, like oxblood and with this trim. So it's kind of got that Tibet, Tibetan sort of temple vibe. Yeah. And I could just see my neighbors looking through the windows going, God, what the fuck is going on there? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's a, you just want a little color, you know, it's weird. Like people, I used to paint my uh, bedrooms, you know, like burgundy and people would be like, oh, it's weird. I'm like, what do you mean? It's white, white walls is weird to me. 
it is kind of weird antiseptic especially if you know your whole life is like that you're like oh here's the office and here's my house and everything's like that and i understand decorating a little bit like here's this painting oh great you know a tapestry or something but anyways yeah so i, I grew up down there and left home with like 125 bucks or something and headed to san francisco on a coin flip well, San Francisco to me in the '90s is Brian Jones Town Massacre. It to me, San Francisco really has a dark tone that no one really talks about, and yeah. it was the soundtrack I felt of that uh, hate Ashbury of the '90s of just the night break, Muriel's Trophy Room, and those jukeboxes and day drinking and all of that. And the and the you know the heroin was starting to come back in in full swing, and Brian Jonestown was just this soundtrack of it, and it was it just some of the most amazing music I had I had ever heard, and just it, you know authentic too. Of course, I knew where it was coming from, but I was like, well, these guys sound. It's not like somebody threw you know a costume on them; they were living it, you know. Yeah, that that was really important to me. One one aspect. I mean, being being that I was born in 1967. But originally, I used to mentally classify it as sort of retroactive, not retro music. Right. You know, just like, and, and when I talk to people, sometimes if they're being cynical and they're like, well, you know, you're blah, 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 copying the 60s or something. I'm like, well, actually, I am from the 60s and you can't take that away from me. But the, the other thing about it is a lot of people that aren't from California are one of these places where people have affluences and suburbs is garages <laughs> garage music comes from, comes from a place where you had access to the the music and and somebody's parents were liberal enough to go this is a positive thing i know where my kids are at, and they're just doing being creative like knock their socks off they put carpet on the walls whatever i don't care and so there was always that thing going on and i always thought that, thought of that music as timeless but as far as the dope thing goes um you know we were much more into acid the the thing about it was early on i used to have this really fast style like if you listen to old velvet underground and and there's like this crazy ripping it's just this hand shaking you know thing going on and i used to play that style and i always wanted to have straight arm style like i'm watching hee-haw with my grandma or something yeah. where these guys have this really straight arm and they're just strumming in perfect time and i could never do that and then um i broke my arm really bad and i was in F sf general for two weeks waiting for an operation because i had a double compound uh fracture and that's where i developed a taste for morphine and demerol because they kept they gave me a button <laughs> oh <laughs> you know because i had bones sticking out of my arm Fuck. and i and and I'd never experienced that kind of feeling. See, even when I had done acid, the, the thing that I, I liked about it was that you'd have to, um, you're like trying to uh, figure out what's going on and control it. Like, okay, I'm going to walk down the street. Like nobody's going to know what's going on. You know, I've got my sunglasses on. I'm just fucking, I'm going to ride the bus or do whatever I got to do. And so you're like mastering all these environments, but still about control. But the thing, um, which is interesting, right? And challenging. But then the thing about the other other stuff is I'd never sat in my whole life and just like looked at my foot and was like perfectly pleased. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> spend yeah. a day just going, wow, you know, <laughs> my foot. So that that was, you know, that's what I found appealing about that. But I basically got in and out of that shit as quick as I could. Yeah, it's a that's a that's a dark turn. But man, there's nothing better than psychedelics, especially like you said during the day when people are mm -hmm. going to work and you're on psychedelics. I love mushrooms. And so when you're walking around San Francisco and you, you see these people in suits going down to the financial district and you're just cooking on mushrooms, it's wild to feel that energy, you know? And we were, we were playing around with the whole how taboo everything was. So when we first were going to play a concert, the week before we put, this is like 1990, we put up posters with arrows going every, to this really hot shit graphics with these arrows going every direction and and a baggie of fake blotter and, and we put them down by the stock exchange and it just said take acid now and then these arrows point <laughs> and then uh, and then we then we put out flyers that just said take acid now and come see our band on friday so it wasn't even like do acid and see our band it was like just take this and before we knew it we were on like mori povich and 
NBC Nightly News and the LSD craze has raised its evil head again in San Francisco amongst the youth. And, then, and it's our band logo. And I'm like, holy shit. And then so we, uh, we, we, we were always bringing out these. I met these black masons, like these old black dudes in Lower Hay where I lived. Mr. Peterson was the main guy's name, the, the master guy at the lodge. And they had this little lounge where they blow off steam because masonic temples generally have one you know it's like a bar just like at a elks lodge you know where the old dudes they shit the, shoot the shit and drink it's their place and um so we'd rent it out you know to mr peterson you know my brother's getting married and then we started just doing parties there as our gigs and there was no security no age limit full bar and it and we would just do these these crazy things and and ricky art guitar player his uncle was Vince N- wellnick in the dead he was the keyboard player for this oh guy. wow oh man great keyboard yeah. player he was in the tubes and everything yeah but, um, so they ended up buying us some, some gear even it was like instantly that the old some of those old chemist dudes were like hey do you guys want your own blotter and i was like no that's not what i want <laughs> 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 that's not what i want at all that's not where i want to go with this uh, but thanks you know it's a beautiful beautiful you know, that's really beautiful. And we've done, we've done like the big family dog shows and all that stuff with the brine shrimp. But yeah, I was never really into that. And then we were on tour this last time and people kept these, these pictures kept coming up of, of like full on blotter with our band logo. And I was like, Oh my God, this is horrible. <laughs> what am I going to do? Wait till the DEA catches these people. And then what sue them for trademark and French. <laughs> I don't know what the hell to do. I don't even know who these people are, but it's just bad news. It just seems like the blanket. It just seemed like one of those things, you know, it seems like the way, the way they catch, they catch those like Arab terrorists, right. Where they're like, Hey, you, you know, you should do something really serious. Oh, uh, okay. Like, and they're like, I don't know. You should get like some missile launchers or something. Well, I don't know where to get missile launchers. Well, I know who where you can get some. Do you want to do it? Um, well, I guess. Okay, we'll pull up over here and we'll bring the missile launcher. And it's, you know, the FBI is just leading these crazy guys into this stuff. It seems like every time in America, you know, it's like some some real idiot. And they're just like, yeah, we got him. To, he was planning to do this, you know, whatever. San Francisco was just... What what a mecca at that time! You landed in a great spot to to start this type of band because it it we had so many venues, you know, we had the I yeah. Beam and the bottom of yeah. the hill, and and you could play everywhere, and people were so acceptive to uh, outside the box music. It wasn't you know, I'm, sure from you know the history of it from the Dead to Metallica to Primus to Brian Jones Town Massacre. It, it wasn't geared around hit songs, which was no. what, what a perfect city, you know? Yeah, it was really cool. But then, it, you know, the the reason why I started a band is because I tried to, like, talk some people that were playing music. You know, you like trying to meet bands that are going, they're looking for somebody. And it's like nobody would have them or nobody was playing anything remotely what I was interested in. So I had to just sort of do it myself, you know? But um, one of the things that was kind of weird is... There, I, I just remember this insane amount of this bizarre competition of people pulling down flyers and just being such jerks. And I, I remember all the effort people would go to try and stop you from doing anything. And, and you know, they, they just melt away eventually. But the other weird thing is we got it cooking. Like, I found that the only way to break into the clubs, because it was all pay to play when I got there. Right. And I was so that's why I did the Masonic Temple thing. So we went right outside the box. And we would have like a thousand people come to each show, you know? And uh, so then my next big trick was um, you just sort of, you go up to these venues and you just say, and we would do it in drag transvest type bars. We didn't care whether it was sixth street or wherever. Right. And we would just take over a night. We just, I would just go in and we'd talk to them and say, it, it could start at any night of the week. We didn't, we did not give a shit. And we would just call it something. I used to call them sound gas. And then I would just go and it would just move locations. Right. So then I wouldn't play every week. See, I would just be talking to other people's band. Oh, you got to play my night. We're going to DJ and this will be good. So it was just to provide something for people to do. But pretty soon, man, it was all these bands from around America going, this is hot shit. We're moving to San Francisco. And then when the record labels all started coming, they were coming early on real quick, you know? And, and it was just like, 
all these bands jumping on it to get these record deals. But even like, even like, uh, you know, those Red House Painters, you know, oh, Red House they, Painters, yeah, they got signed to opening up for us. And there was just all these weird bands that came from like Phoenix, Atlanta, all these places just to be a part of something going on. And it was so weird how everybody was. And the other thing that um, I remember about them was, you know, they'd be playing like three times a week, all these bands. And the minute they got these deals or whatever, you never heard of them again. They were always like disappeared and she tortured to play once somebody was paying their rent. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, where I'm, I'm such the opposite. I just love playing, you know what I mean? So that's why I'm still playing, I guess. I was the same way. We played some gigs together. I was in a band uh, and, you know, uh, we'd play the Paradise like three yeah. nights a week, man. Yeah, just anytime you could. Yeah, just residencies and clubs and and you know that we were doing like 250 gigs a year. It was to me, it was, yeah, you could play like the mission, and then the next night you'd play in hate, and then the next night you play in North Beach, and then you'd go yeah. over and play in Berkeley. It was like you were on tour. There was clubs I never even played at that people played at, like El Room or yeah. stuff like that, you know. But you know, and you would anytime you heard about anybody coming to town, you know, you were hustling. Let me get on that bill to open up at bottom of the hill you know that's how we played with oasis nobody even knew who they were and we're like let us play ramona was a ramona. genius man yeah she she just fucking she seemed to know man like she'd be like oh yeah we're gonna get oasis in here oh let's get the verb you know like there was serious bands playing in that place sure well you know for a long time she was going out with kozak so they were like power couple <laughs> yeah 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 poster king but, uh, the reason why i liked her is she stood up because we were we were banned so many times, you know, first like Bill Graham tried to step on us because the Fillmore was next door to the People's Temple, which is ironic, ironic once again, because we started out at the Black Masonic Temple, which was held in the line of the Tabernacle, Lamb of the Tabernacle Church in the Lower Hay, right next to the Horseshoe Cafe, not, not the Horseshoe, but God, I can't remember what, what it was called, right, right across from um, Knock Knock and all that crap. Anyways, that was the original People's Temple. <laughs> so we started oh, out. It was? It was before they, they got a considerable amount of money and moved next door to this giant building that they bulldozed when that happened. And that's now the post office that's next right. to. Yeah. Some people say the post office is haunted. I always laugh when people say that. Yeah, Probably is. People. Yeah. It, to a certain extent, except, the, you know, there's a lot of funky connections as far as uh, the establishment goes and uh, what Jim Jones was able to accomplish. Like, they, for instance, they cleared out a lot of the foster children roster the church just adopted everybody and took them to Guyana, which is crazy and a lot of people off the people that were in like camarillo and all these mental uh, mental estates you know state care when reagan cut those guys loose, a lot of those people ended up in that you know and then oh, yeah. it was just so uh, you know jim jones that that's insane jim jones like just to think about how yeah how quick he you know was able to establish like that full blown cult, you know, it was really interesting. Some, some things that I heard about it, you know, from people, um, you know, like a normal uh, sort of, you go into a normal church and the altar and the pulpit there, you know, you walk through the doors and it's like this long, uh, you know, you, you, the pews or whatever going down and then way up at the front up high, is this this preacher the leader of the congregation right so like you walk in the doors and then way down at the other end of the room that's where the guy reading the sermon is right he did it the other way around so you had to walk in around these blinds he was right at the door right so you had to walk on either side of these blinds and go down two aisles to go all the way to the back and if you wanted to leave you had to walk past everybody facing him the whole time and he would just oh, really kill you yo. so it was like the, the walk of shame if you decided you were gonna bail you know what i mean because everybody just turned around because they'd go like what the hell are you doing it and everybody's just looking at you and he's just like ridiculing you so evidently it was like a heavy trip once you're in you know like you're sitting there you guys have like the greatest band name ever there was a time in san fran where it's the brian jonestown massacre medieval Knievel and ario speed dealer these yeah. crazy band names you know but yours was by by far the greatest band name you know but it was also trouble you know like when uh when, yeah but once again you know the, uh, bill graham and those guys i think it was funny so and plus like uh early on 
people used to do some freak out stuff. I remember even at the Peacock Lounge when we started, it's just like we were getting go, just really kicking butt and people would just flip tables and, and they weren't being hooligans or anything. I just think it's this thing when you have like low, low watts, when, you, when you're playing like 15 or 30 watts yeah. and you're not playing like 100 watt amps screaming, people just get sucked into this thing in the same way that when they used to watch the Yardbirds or the Stones play, people used to do the same thing. When you have a certain age, and it's just such a release to be like having a blast and the music isn't killing your ears. It's just like at a certain level. And, and it's the same thing when, when you, when you, when you when you're in a basement or, you know, in a, I remember the early days of seeing punk bands at people's houses and stuff. We don't have the full PA system blaring your head off. It's just so much more crazy good, you know? Because that max level is a, it's maximum energy. It doesn't like maximum pain in your face, which I think is something that metal people really dig. It's yeah. like leaning into that. And ED, EDM people really like the low end of that, just getting lost in it on drugs or something. But the, you know, we try and play without a lot of the sub, the subs, and uh, keep that within reason those volumes because of that reason. I think. How did, how did you get started? Like, were you, you were just living in LA and, and did you hear uh, music that made you want to get a guitar? Did you go out and buy a guitar? How did, cause I never knew the history of how you actually get started. Were you in other bands uh, before yeah. the Brian Jonestown? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, when we were like little kids and stuff, uh, you know, we would know older people in bands and stuff. And we were like breaking into the cuckoo's nest in Orange County, which is right up on the hill. Yeah, like right as right as he entered in Costa Mesa, it was a legendary punk band, uh, punk venue, like the Damned, Nine Nine Nine, PIL, uh, not PIL, but just like everybody played there. Magazine, Black Flag, just every band you can possibly think of. That's that's where they played. And Circle Jerks. Yeah, I mean, but regularly, that was the the place as you're going down the coast with the wildest place ever. And we figured out when we were like eleven or so that the myth wasted youth and all that stuff those famous pictures and stuff of people doing the flips off the stage but um the song would start right and the kids would do flips off the stage right into the pit and um the bouncers would grab them and come screaming at the back door and then kick open the bar on the door and throw them out right so we figured out really early like if you see this door right here that if you that if you just stood against the door like this right the door would come flying open at the start of every song with the bouncers throwing somebody out and we would just slip in excellent, <laughs> just excellent. Right, right right across the stage to do a flip and, and the bouncers couldn't catch us <laughs> and even if, even if they could um there's no way to stop you because you'd just be right out to do the same thing again so we started getting into every single show that way but we started starting bands together basically every time somebody's parent was away Back then, I just remember being young and every, you just call around like, do you know of any parties? Because it's endless suburban land, right? So it's all about crashing parties. Oh, yeah, we know of this this party on 53rd Street and such and such or wherever it was and what. And you just everybody would just tear it, tear down there. Oh, yeah. K 10 kegger party with two mm -hmm. bands. And you're just like, fuck, yeah, I'm there. So every every time somebody was away you know it was like an excuse or like oh let a band play and you just make up something you know it'd be like step and stone a couple songs you just try and pull it off and they would turn into other bands playing but it was this non-stop thing so it's like every every party was an excuse to start a band with your friends or start a band then excuse to throw a party it was weird you know we would start doing these bands and then we would get we were like the most popular people in school but the biggest outsiders immediately because we had the line on all that parties <laughs> yeah but you know my like my teenage band all these people sang in it after me i think that guy mark mcgrath who's like on entertainment tonight joined the band to take my place i think scott wiling was in it after me wow, wow. yeah no but in the in the same in the same band it was just so weird because it was like um you know like right as i was leaving we had a keyboard player and he joined berlin and then wrote take my he, take my breath away <laughs> you know it's just like this very bizarre band but when we started out i just named it electric kool-aid because i love that book and then it was just funny and then like everybody in the band like jamie reedley i forget who he plays with now god these guys are all like johnny two bags is in social distortion 
all these people are just in other bands but you know we were just like making stuff up yeah. and we were just in sixth grade and stuff so and what, what was your first guitar just kind of like a, a copy guitar like a kent or something? well my my no 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 see my first guitars i got when i was like six so i got uh like the buck owens and uh there was oh, like yeah. a roy the red white blue one I got the red, red, white, and blue one, but they also they also had a black one. So it was like it was like God. It was Buck Owens and Roy, Roy Buchanan, the other guy. You know, they were the Roy team. Rogers. No, not Roy Rogers. He's a cowboy. But he is, well, I forget what his name his name was. But um, they were the two guys anyway. So they were harmony guitar. Those are harmony guitars. Yeah. And they only stayed in tune like a couple days before I turned them in, into sitars, kind of like Sonic Youth. <laughs> <laughs> So then, I, and I had that style for a while, but I started messing about with synthesizers with my friends because I was really only interested in singing. But I started, you know, I'd been screwing around. I taught myself how to play piano when I was a kid. And I started getting really into like screwing with those things through with 60s guitar amps and just making this really not so sound, you know, which the only th thing I can compare it to is, you know, because we liked crowd walk and we liked like, so we were into everything. It wasn't just punk. Punk was just like a stepping stone. And we really like psychedelic music, but also kraut rock and all that stuff. So it's really hard to describe, but, but um, you know, I was really into all that, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I never thought that synthesizer music was going to anywhere because everybody's like, fuck you, synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so eventually I dropped out like a hammer. I just went back to my roots, kind of. If you know what I mean? Although I, I've continued to play, like I still play, I have like a ton of them, but uh, I play all kinds of instruments. So it's just one of those things. But I, I you know, I, I understood it when it came out, but I never imagined that Depeche was going to be so massive. Played a hundred thousand theaters all over the world. It's bananas, you know? I didn't yeah. see that one coming. Now, or especially when sampling just took over and now we live in non music beat land. It's like a tribal thing has nothing to do with music whatsoever like most music has no music in it <laughs> yeah. it's just it's it's just it's just tribal it's where you get into a rhythm and you emulate ever uh, everything else that's going on to sort of get accepted in your tribe but, but that's what all of it is you know but music is music so you know which is something different it has like mathematics and proportions or else re rebellion against that like uh, whether it's dissident jazz or metal or whatever it's like how you mess with that uh you know what i mean i i, I, I can't even believe this uh mm -hmm. first of all i wanted to tell you that you are a, a a big inspiration to someone like me who's been on stage most of his life also in the whole thought of never quit and keep writing and keep performing and keep keep doing it you know like you the amount of of records you have made the amount of songs you have wrote and it is it is incredible how much content you have put out how much music yeah I'm, uh, well i'm really interested in in doing it but uh, there's a couple of different things you know like my goals are different i think than other people's goals like first of all i thought i thought it was interesting that um your goal could be to be known for doing a, a certain kind of thing, which is being anti-validation, <laughs> right. like in the sense that you need permission to do anything, which is w what was like a an original ethos of do it yourself or when people were inspired by, it doesn't matter the pistols, right? Or Iggy or whatever the fuck it is. They're like, fuck this, I'm gonna do my own thing, right? So originally a lot of people had that motivation and that fostered post-punk and new wave and all that other stuff, right? Into a million different fractured pieces. It could be the B-52s, it could be Depeche Mode, it could be Jesus and Mary Jane. It doesn't matter what you're talking about, right? But a lot of people, they, they're they like, yeah, but I want this guy to say it's okay um, because he's going to get me the gong, you know, he's going to get me the Grammy, he's going to get me my house payment, supermodel, all these different things. You know what I mean? They're, they're like, this is the fast track to all those things. They're not really into the music. It, it just bums me out because that's nobody reads the contract. So everybody gets flushed down the toilet that signs that contract, all of them the same. I've seen them all rise and fall. Every single band, even David Crosby bitching about how he doesn't make any money off of um, 
because of Spotify, you know, he's got to put his face on a, a dime bag of weed or something to make it to save his house. Right. That's his fault. You know, he's a multimillionaire by the time he's 22. So it's his own, you know, you fucking get busted with a couple of keys of Coke and a gun and do 10 years or whatever the fuck he did, you know, have a few divorces and there goes that money. So, but the main deal is he doesn't make any money because he doesn't own anything. So right. it was his bright idea. But because they had talent, you know, they, a lot that culture was different. That access meant something, I think. But people, those those people, it's so fucking weird how a lot, a lot of the old guard, man, they don't give up anything to anybody else. Like no matter what you accomplish. They, yeah. Because if, if you didn't make it the way that they made it, you didn't make it, which is so weird, you know, because like the door has sold. 760,000 copies of light my fire boy it's got staying power and they, they they went quadruple platinum in the 80s and all that stuff with la woman compilation but 760,000 copies right and it is a big deal right because it was played a lot on the radio and all that shit but you know i got like 69 million spins of a song on like spotify i don't know what that counts for but when you divide it up by Spotify dollars or whatever it is, it's considerably more than the tourists got from Light My Fire because they, they, I mean, they're they're still you know like twenty five percent royalty. Wow! Oh, because you own everything. I got what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, but all no, but also just like as far as access on things, if you go backwards, it's like the it's just the sheer amount of people listening to something in every format. Right, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, vinyl, plus the, plus the fucking TV shows and God knows what, Anthony Bourdain or who knows, you know who cares, right? Yeah. But what I'm saying is like people just still just go, huh? You know, then you'll like watch little Stephen or you little Stephen will have his underground garage or something on on serious serious, yeah. It'll be ran or raving about some fucking who who cares, you know, like like it was like wow, this is amazing. But you know that guy, it, 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 that guy would never give us the time of day because we're rock and roll and uncouth, which is just amazing. He like he'll play the fucking mafia on TV and be like, oh, I'm gonna fucking cut your nuts off, you know, like all this shit. Like what did the Sopranos get up to, right? But no, Anton's like said told Elon Musk to go fuck himself. So that's not okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, we live in this twisted menagerie of just filth. It's so weird. Not, not because I mean, on the, on the other hand, I'm going to shut up in a second, but this isn't sour grapes. Cause I understand like you, when I first put out our first records, you know, and all this stuff, I was just like, Oh yeah. We bring you a message from the kids of America. Your business sucks. You know, like, fuck you. So you can't have it both ways. You can't absolutely tell every record company to go fuck themselves and get invited on to like late night with Trevor Noah or whatever it is. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it doesn't work that way. If you're an authentic outlaw, it does not work that way. You're right. Because usually people play the outlaw for a little while and then they get rid of that real quick to get into the machine. But it's like so crazy, right? The whole world, like you look at these hip hop guys, you're like, oh my God, look at these motherfuckers with their AKs and a fucking Lamborghini, except who fucking leased that car and who's paying the million insurance on that film crew and how many lawyers are standing if you flip the camera around? See, it's all a big fucking illusion. I, I think that, you know, what people really don't understand, and mm. it was interesting to watch the movie Dig again. I remember when it came out, but the amount of fucking grind that you have been through actual grind of living nowhere it, it may be eating and sleeping somewhere it, it, sure. it is unreal that'll break down 99.9 percent .9 of every person yeah well you know i made a lot of weird situations because people were like oh you gotta come record right and I'd get in recording and people would say, oh, my God, I want you to have a meeting with such and such from Mercury Records. And the next thing they would be saying, we just want 50 percent of your money for all time. We want, you're going to be the next Kurt Cobain. We're going to help you do it. I'm like, the fucker's dead. Don't do me no favors. So, you know, at a certain point, I was like doing these things where I would be like, Give, uh, somebody want to give me a hand. So I'd have a studio in one place, I'll record somebody's recording studio. And then I'd hook up another one of these deals in another place. And I would be like on the couch and be one of these things where I would help them like for not human. I 
helped him make this vintage keys thing for emulator where I just sampled every single key of these organs, all these organs that I buy and have and stuff for these recording sessions. And then I would clip them. So it would be for their disc package. So you could run it in a sampler, right? So I'd have it with reverb, with vibrato, without clean through this amp, every single one. So that's the samples that exist in the world now. And, um, and I trade it for studio time or, or else I'd be like, just sleeping on the couch, sitting there waiting for somebody to close up their st- session because people couldn't, they didn't, they didn't have that kind of st- stamina. So people would record, even if they knocked it off at two, I could just pick it up right at two and go until the next person should come rolled in at one. You know, the minute they rolled up, I'd say, okay, I'll have this broken down in like 15 minutes and be ready to go. And then I'd go ahead right to the other studio and do the same exact thing nonstop because there was no way to even... If you think about studios being minimum of 500 a day or something, say like it was 350 on a deal, and even the best deals for a room would be like 350 a month. So just trying to pull that off regularly to, to record like I record on the fly, there was no way to have an apartment in Dubai. So I was willing to do whatever, sleep in the back of a car, whatever it takes to move forward as far as because what I wanted to do. I'd be seeing somebody and they'd go like, you need to get a job. And not, they, they, they couldn't even realize like I'd be making three albums at once going, well, I mean, I kind of do have a job, but they didn't really see like one day I went to work and wrote, wrote an enemy and my kids will never have to work again. See what I'm saying? Like one day it took me like three hours, just bag that or something, make yeah. it up, bag it. And it'll just pay for everything. I live in Europe. It doesn't even matter. So like they were very short That one song? They, is that yeah, one? Our, wow that's just an example of one thing no but uh, i mean i have other things i did the, the boardwalk empire was like a tr- more it was like getting two record deals at once and, I, and that was a, just that was just like two hours work one day that i just whipped out that song so that people never they never really they didn't understand what's going on and even my friends were like blah 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 you know i, I don't understand why I'm practically homeless. And we, we can drive the Porsches. If you refuse to sign record deals. I'm like, well, this is not selling my songs. You write your own fucking songs and so on. I'm not yeah, selling my yeah. songs. I don't mind making stuff with people. Yeah. But that starts when they they start with a deal. But it, it, see, it, I beat a lot of those all the hip hop guys out the jar when I eventually just said I'm the producer. See. Right. And that's when when things started cooking because people are like, okay. Here's a shitload of money. See, because I used to just say, buy me a studio. And they're like, you're insane. But then I said, I'm the producer. And then they just hand over a fucking giant check and say, produce. Wow. You know, yeah. So then, you know, but I, I would just like, had to get through all that shit. But in the movie, it's, it's, it's I guess it's, it's quite strange because you see a lot of reactions or something like my reactions to things you don't really see. Like, for instance, I own all the band's gear. And I started that early on because, say, like we were open up with Oasis or something, right? And one guitar player would show up, song or two into the set with no guitar. I'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? Where's your guitar? It's in the pawn shop. So I got hit really quick. I'm like, okay, no matter who I kick out of this fucking band, the, the, the music and the sound is going to stay the same because I'm going to own all the gear. It's oh. just going to be banned gear. And you have no stake in that because you didn't buy it. You didn't think of this. That's an amazing uh, like concept. I never even thought about it. It's like create the sound and just move the players in and out. You be whatever because it's not like I, I'm going to be 55 this year. It's not everybody's exact dream. Like uh, we, I got a phone call today. We're going to be headlining another show. Like over the summer, we're playing one big concert a month. So everybody flies in. We play it. They fly out from all over the world. And, you know, I got tired of saying, well, we were just on tour for seven weeks. We'll be fine a month from now. Because we're not fine. And we're headlining big ass shows, right? Festivals or whatever. No, that's not good enough. Come in and we practice a little bit and then we go play. And somebody's saying, oh, yeah, my lady, this, that, you know, I just want to just fly in and fly out. And I'm like, I'm not feeling that magic because I want to be good. Yeah, you're not playing a giant festival with no rehearsal. Getting paid enough money, I get, a bit, get enough money to fucking be paid uh, to fly in and stay in hotels and be picked up and go to Europe and make a bunch of money and go home. You know, it's like the the biggest pain in the ass thing about that is oh I have to sit on a plane from California to Europe but uh, I guess the flip side is that 
of that is like you know you get paid like a month's salary for doing it <laughs> yeah. like two days or whatever so i don't know what the, you know like a normal guy has to get up and deal with all this shit and you know all the things that you have to do in, in your life you know which a lot of it is just eating crow i guess for people that's that the, the big problem is the same way the same way that most most people kiss ass for money something i can't function with you know what i mean that's the hardest part about being in a band is dealing with these these people you know and the older they get it worse it gets you know because it's like they've they've really kind of tapped out of doing art once they uh commit to other things and that's fine if they want to do that uh, you know meaning kids or uh, a mortgage or you know car payment every all of that once they get that that ball and chain on them everything's like ah oh, can i just get the money and stay on my couch you know well, this, what the thing is is most most groups if they get someplace they you know they sign some contract and in the contract it basically says that the people that are loaning you the money actually own everything about you. So then you get dropped because it isn't making money. Yep. And so every band that you ever heard of, I've seen on TV or magazine, all that shit, you just don't hear of them for 20 years until that contract sort of fades. And then all of a sudden it's also this nostalgia trip. And then they're all back on the road. doesn't matter who it is, right? It could be pavement. It's like some contract wears out, then everybody's back on the road. But, um, I guess one of the guys in that band is a bartender. I can't imagine that that's more fun than being in a band, huh. but evidently it is for those guys right. or whatever it is. But me, I like to play music, you know, that last tour that you were just on. I mean, mm. you guys did the will turn here. Yeah. You know, like that, that's no joke. That is a big venue. Were you playing yeah. mostly big venues like that across the States on the last run? Yeah. We play like that all around, around the world. This fucking that's pretty much, pretty much our size. I love it. How many years now? Because what, 93 it started? No, we started we started in 1990. Wow. But you know, uh it was it was it was hard to get some certain things going. Like I think the first single came out in ninety-two. It it was it was hard to get get some aspects of it going, you know? Yeah. It was hard enough just to like work out even getting through rehearsal uh stage. You know, because you had to get to like Turk Street or someplace, right? Oh, yeah, your gear. Yeah. yeah. You have to make associations. Pawn shop layaways, just getting equipment, just building all that stuff up from just nothing. You know, it's, it's quite hard. Drummers drummers were hard trying to find people that would just could or would play. Because that that, that in and of itself is a pain, pain in the ass in an urban environment. Like I, I would think like Chicago or New York or uh, uh so in, in some, one of these places of uh, san francisco one of these urban places think about if you live upstairs carrying this fucking ton of drums you can't even oh. bring it on the bus you're just fucked you know yeah yeah uh drums the worst and and finding and even uh good drummers you know they're always in bad bands yeah yeah it, it took me a long time to sort of like you're playing with somebody and their drummer kicks ass to just like walk right up on stage and go you know what <laughs> We got to play music together. Fuck this, you know. Like it took me. It took me many, many. It took me like two decades to be able to say that to somebody, you know, because most most good drummers are in fucking horrible bands that all get along. Like you don't need to get along. You need to be in a good band. Yeah, that makes everything. That makes everything possible. I got to tell you that that doc dig could be the greatest rock doc of all time. There was a lot of other aspects about it. See, this this girl who who's, who was my friend, she's a billionaire, and she bankrolled a lot of that shit. I didn't know at the time, but I made friends with her afterwards. And um, we had spy cameras and all this shit, and we gave them the access. See, because William Morris set me up with that project. So it was about 10 bands. And I just said, this is a bunch of bullshit. I just said, there's this band I know of that you guys don't know of, and this will be better. This is black and white, because they're going to do whatever they can you know, to go for it. They're going to yeah. just kiss every ass in the industry. Right. And they're perfect. And I, and I, and I just, I just told the, the, those people the first day I met them, Andy, and I just said, I'm just going to say no the whole time, no matter what anybody, anybody says or does, I'm just going to say no way. No, no fucking way. And this is why. And so they, they, we filmed all everything, all the meetings and 
all the threats and everything that people threw up against us. And they didn't get, they, I know Auntie's gotten a lot of successes or accolades and shit, but she's a fucking idiot. She didn't have me or Courtney signed off on a release. Oh, wow. Until it already, until it already won. I just gave her a festival release. They didn't have my signature to even have permission to use anything. So there was a lot of people like that in the film. And so they had no fucking clue what they were going to do. So all of a sudden you couldn't have any of those dickheads from the, you know, hi, I'm Mr. Fucking White Bucks at Big Dick Records. You know, it's like, no, none of those people. And and that was the interesting thing because basically I set out to show people what was going on with the whole thing. Because I watched everybody basically sign the, the same exact deal. And it's so meaningless, you know, it doesn't matter who it, like every band I would see on 120 minutes or didn't matter who they are. It's all a bunch of bullshit. Like when you look into what people really are up to, what they're doing or what their, their life's are like about, like they really didn't accomplish that much. When you would think about reading the magazines, whether it was spin or doesn't matter. Right. It's like fucking all these people. It, that, that, that thing is uh, like, like the brutality and the honesty of that thing is wild just to see you and, and, and especially that Viper Room brawl and the whole thing, you know, go down. Yeah, but the guy, the, the guy really was, the, the weird thing about it was the guy really was being a chump, this guy that I was playing with. He yeah. really kind of did go to his head really quickly. I think his name is Robert Desmond or something. He, he, he just, um, the moment really went to his head and he stopped playing music, which we had already, we were prepared to do some very good stuff. And he really just fucked everything up. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it wasn't it wasn't about any of that. It was about uh, the, we were about ready to drop crazy, crazy good songs, and the way they sounded, and he just like blew it. Yeah. Which is fine because there was nothing. Ultimately, there was nothing that I was trying to accomplish. Even though I guess Electra put in six hundred bucks for the band or some shit. You know, it was kind of like an industry showcase. But I didn't look at it like that. You know. <laughs> like a, they, they they didn't blow my deal with Electra, and even if they did, you know, like you look at a band like Stairlab, and it's like whatever, you know what I mean? Tim lives in Berlin, I live in Berlin. Who cares, right? I can yeah. live anywhere I want to live. Yeah, you know what I mean? They only just got their their music back. <laughs> you know? Damn. There, there were there's a lot of bands on labels that are sort of prestige lit bands. See meaning that they exist like Sonic Youth exists not to make money. They existed to. So Nirvana said, Oh, this is fucking amazing. I want to be on this label where they've got these guys on it. It's like that. There's always some of those. I was watching some footage of the last tour Fillmore and, and there it was still had some fire going. There was a a band fight on stage. I was like, Oh, there it is. (laughs) Uh, It isn't that it's funny because Ryan, uh, why do plays keyboards and stuff? He's got like one whole range of his ears burned out. So every time he thinks he sees my lips moving, he thinks I'm yelling at him or some shit. Like I won't even be talking to him. And he's just like, he'll just butt in there. And his parents were there. So he got a little bent out of shape and just stormed off. So it was just kind of funny. But we'd been through a lot of stuff and we just caught COVID. We just had all of our gear stolen. Yeah. But I also just, just, Besides the Hammond B3 organ and Leslie that, that I had in the trailer, I rented that whole setup for him and he, he didn't have a clue how to play it. So he ended up barely even playing it. So I was just laughing because I just spent 800 bucks on that fucking B3 to be there, you know, and because of his hearing too, I tell him exactly. I'm like, oh, just put the pedal to seven and just trust that it's there. Tell the guy to turn your monitor up or something. And he just doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. Like, do you know what I mean? Unless it's... Right. He doesn't believe it's playing or some shit. I'm like, you can't have it that loud. <laughs> so it's already some weird thing. It's like there's a certain amount of trust. Like, it's like with my guitar. It doesn't matter if I'm playing in a stadium or like last weekend at this fucking big festival, right? Or if I'm in a, in, in a room, like my studio, the, the volumes are always the same level in every single room I go to. It's always like on, th- my guitar is always on three. So it doesn't matter. I just trust that it's like that. And I stand at a certain distance and I can hear just me and that's fine. But, you know, and I tell everybody else, just don't fuck with your volumes. Just leave them the way they always are. That's the way it's going to sound good. Trust me. <laughs> because I know. Yeah. Yeah. 
that fucking gear stolen shit, man. I, I can't believe you guys got it back. That was great. Yeah, it was really weird, huh? Yeah, very, that is. Just, very strange. Oh, I was uh, retweeting it nonstop and Instagram and just get getting some eyes on that, man. Stolen gear. And, uh, you know, Portland's just a madhouse right now up there. Have you been up there? Yeah. It's bananas. It it's like is. The third world. It's like the yeah. third world. It's crazy. It's because, you know, we, we played in Buenos Aires and Santiago in Chile, and you land at the airport and you're driving for like three, four miles towards the city, you know, the center of the city. And that's just like that. People just got tarp houses and cars all parked on the side of the road. They're just living. It's like a strip of people living right on the side of the freeway. Yeah. All the way into the city. And Portland's exactly like that now. So fucking bananas. Some of the, some of the most money, rich people going, and then the poorest people. Yeah, especially when they do that, though. You know, they it's not just the docks on the Willamette, you know, that they're totaling some of those old areas, right? And building, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's exactly like Vancouver, BC now, with those glass tower condo shit that they build. They're building a whole new skyline going down the river of these like 20 story jobs, you know, that are really like steel and glass towers, like real modern. Yep. But they're just displacing a lot of people, I think. And um, even like my bass player bought a house up in the 90s, uh, you know, like the 95th Street or whatever the hell it is, right? And he got over and he was like, first day he's like, God, right before I left, there was four murders unrelated within like one block of my house I'm like wow man that's crazy and then next day he's like crap there's been 10. whoa <laughs> reads the paper whoa. again it's just bananas yeah he was he was he was supposed to come practice on tour uh, before our last tour and he's like i'm gonna be a couple of days late i gotta take care of a few things i'm like really i guess okay i'll be there I'm like what do you gotta do he's like fuck this like speed freak crackheads living next door like throwing stoves around and all kinds of fucking beating each other up and i gotta build a 10 foot high fence wow so my, my, so my lady he doesn't get freaked out i gotta Fortress. build a wall yeah. Yeah, exactly so i gotta build a wall and this is insane with my dad i'm like Fuck. how long you been in berlin 15 years wow 15 years how do you like it yeah i mean obviously you like it but uh is it, is it like cool? I've been to Berlin a few times, but what's it like living there? Everybody likes it. I live in a Cheap? really, really nice for me. It is. Yeah. I've been here a long time. Yeah. I think my, my rent's like 780 or something. Whoa. For two rooms. This is like, you know, the roof flat. And so then I got this in my studio. Cheapest chips. Trees. Wow. Looks beautiful. Yeah. yeah it's all super calm and a very nice area. That's no, cool as shit. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, new record. Oh, first of all, I did want to tell you this, that my buddy Underground is, I thought, one of you know, the greatest records in your catalog. I love weird it. Shit. I love it, man. I love yeah. that record. I love weird, weird shit that you put on and you're just like, somebody, rec- someone made this record, you know? But yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of weird too. Also, like, sometimes it's really good if you, you write and you're doing stuff and sometimes it's good to like just have a cleansing moment yeah we just let it rip and it has nothing to do with anything you know like you're not i'm obviously not trying to do pop music or anything it's just like i'm just burning money in a studio like i'm just gonna fucking scream into the walls <laughs> or whatever it is right but it's really it's really healthy for you you see like when you experiment sometimes like that Versus like, especially if you, if you, if you're always continuously making music, I don't think you have to do resets like that all the time in your life. But I think for me, it was really healthy to just screw around in Iceland and do mess, mess it out. Cause I, my whole life, I've never really had an idea necessarily that I'm bringing into the studio unless I'm racing, unless it's caught in my head, I'm racing in there to like document it before it slips away. But I always just press record. So, oh wow, you just write in the studio. I write as I press record. The words and everything are all first take. Really? So I just let it rip. Uh, like the last stuff, you know, once I got on a roll, every, every single day, I had no idea. So I put like a cable on the call string and I, I was paying two of my friends that are in my band to like come every day. 
right? And then so they would sit down and I would plug in my 12 string for one second, you know? And I would go, I guess this is a, the cables to the G fret. Well, it sounds good to me when it's plugged in my amp right, right this minute, you know? And I would just strum something for one second. I'd be like, okay, play this beat and you follow me. And as soon as the uh, Hawking gets what I'm playing, I play inside out of it. And I'm like, okay, this is what the change is. Let's go through this for one second. This part, you got to end. You, you understand? We'll end it like this. Okay. And then I, I, I walk over to where all the, I say flip off the amps. And then we, we pull out the plugs and I plug them into my preamps. Like I figure out exactly what the click track is. Like basically where, where the snare would be, like an ultra slow click, click track. And that's just so I can sync things like trim low. But also so the drums can float kind of within it. It's like a lot of swing time because of, I play with swing time. But it's so I can trigger tremolo or delay or whatever I want later. And then we just track it live. Like I use the amp simulators. So it's just like in one speaker, it's one guitar, one in the other. We just play live, flow straight through it. And then I just overdub everything and I'm done. I do the vocals. I'm out of there by seven o'clock. So. <sighs> So in about three out three hours, and it was just knocking them out one, one after another. I don't know, like we did like seventy songs or something. Damn, you got the new record coming out. Fire doesn't grow on trees. Uh, June twenty fourth, right? Yeah, and and maybe I'll surprise you with something else. Oh yeah. Uh, there's this director Scott Derrickson. He did Doctor Strange, and he's basically a horror director. He did that one. What is it? The Exorcism of Emily Rose. And oh, yeah. Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He has a new movie called Black Phone with Ethan Hawke. Uh -huh. And then Ethan Hawke is this like um, fucked up serial killer. And it's about it's in the 70s and he's killing young teenage boys. He's, he's like a clown devil. Wow. He just pulls up and he's kidnapping all these kids and killing them. And uh, so I've got music in that one. So it's coming out on the same day. I got a really big part, but the movie's worth watching. It's very disturbing, but it's got a light ending, so it's good. <laughs> so you got a bunch of music in that? Yeah, I, I got got a few minutes. Uh, a few minutes is very good for a movie. Wow, that's I got your great. attention for a few minutes. Yeah, it's a big deal too because this movie is it's it's going to be quite big. It's it's like Stephen King level heavy. Like wow, people already freaking. Yeah, Ethan Hawke is scarier than shit in it too. Oh. So. Did you see that Matt Dillon serial killer movie? Uh, the house that Jack mm. built came out like three mm. years ago. Mm. That see, I'm not in it. I, I, I didn't even enjoy uh, watching this before I had to make up this music. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I did. I mean, I stuck it out. And I, it was like, okay, this is not, it's not my thing. You know, I'm like a little kid. I just enjoy chilling out. Yeah. So you got the new record coming out and then you guys just completed the U S tour. Are you going to come back to the States at all? What we got going on is like I said, one, one show a month. This, we just played France like on the seventh, 17th. We play in Austria in Graz. We're headlining some pre guest festival. And then uh, in July, no, that is July. Um, August we're doing the Bay Switzerland for this really great festival in the lake we've played a bunch of times but that one's called knocks away it's great 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 part of switzerland the french side it's like where nestle the uh, it's like when you see those mountains on the evian bottle that's 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 the mountain right in front of you on the lake so we're going to do that and then the end of september we start touring all of europe and then we do that till the end of the year and then we start up again do all the UK in January, February, and back into Europe. Looks like we're going to hit the rest of the world. So great to see Joel in there, you know, still rocking the tambourine. Yeah, he's doing good. He's doing really good. Uh, Where's he living? He, you know, he has two places. So uh, somebody hooked him up over COVID times to uh, to New Hampshire by a lake. They were just like, fuck it, you can live in this pad on the lake, you know, like a dream, right? Yeah. Uh, unless you're actually living in a Stephen King movie and somebody's got you chained to a bed and nobody can hear you scream. But anyways, except a moose that wants to see you dead. No, anyways, so 
I guess he's got a new flat back in the Bay Area. So oh, wow. he's, they're making that move right now. And drum roll, please. He got a book deal with uh, Simon Schuster. Schuster and Simon, whatever they're. Yeah. The big one. They're uh, for his book. Wow. What's the book about? Well, he's been doing this patron um, writing for a few years, telling telling the tales about his life and hanging out, me and him and the whole thing, right? Wow. And he's been doing that for a couple of years and finally he got a book. So like we really like the way you write and everything. You could change this this one thing about it, but start again. You know, like start start from the top. Here's your here's your book. Wow. Yeah. And he didn't take it bad either. You know, like in, they didn't say like, oh, we're gonna get this person to sit on your head or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're gonna get Jerry Seinfeld and fucking take it up a notch or whatever the fuck that they t- do for people. They didn't, they didn't say that. They said, we basically like you, but you know, think about this, you know, the, this, which is cool. It, you know what I mean? If you know it, like some people, they intuitively pick up stuff or some people, they got it and other people have to work hard. Does that make, make sense to you? Absolutely. Like at your, at your thing. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah. Like if you don't just magically stumble into that thing, no matter how fast and how bright you burn, it's sometimes it's nice to have somebody with a little bit of perspective just go, have you thought about this? Because what you're doing is brilliant, but think about this one little trick or this literary device or whatever. It could be anything, right? Just to keep it going, I guess, or flowing better or something, whatever it is they wanted. He didn't, he didn't find it stifling right? When that con- when that conversation came up. So I think that's cool. That is great. I mean, sometimes uh, somebody on the outside uh, that's not evil, you listen to and go, you know what? Uh, this guy's right. You know, I mean, once in a while, it's great. Yeah. You know, but but also there's like people that go to art school and they've got this fantastic thing going and the teacher's like, no, you got to learn this other thing. And they're like, I hate art. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you thank you for making me hate yeah. this. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Rules of art are always weird because rules and art, those two shouldn't ever be together. Those words. Yeah. I I was trying to think about who was it? Uh, I don't think it was Coons. It was somebody. Let me think. Somebody damn famous. Who did the swimming pools and all that shit? You know, like when like it's a real pastel and like there's some chick jumping in the swimming pools and Hockney. It was Hockney or somebody came out and fucking said, figured it all out. It's like, oh, you know, all those Renaissance geniuses that you thought, like, this is exactly how they did it with this, like, you know, like the perspective, or they use this reflection from this shaped jar or whatever on everything, you know, to like sketch it out, like to get the perspectives right on everything. Yeah. And they're like, no, you can't say that. Cause it was like deflating everybody's like, oh my God, the master this, the master that. This is so realistic. Nobody'd ever done this before. But then they figured out like there's just this one like parlor house trick that that what some person figured out and then they all just did this one thing that aided in their perspective. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like when, uh, when like how, how is this so realistic that instead of like just this? right out of their head, right? You know, it wasn't that at all. You're like, oh my god, they tied a piece of string to a nail. This is fucking insane. You know what I mean? <laughs> or whatever, right? You know, they cheated. Yeah, the whole the whole establishment was just like fuck you. <laughs> That's fucking great, man. Well, man, I, uh, I I'm super bummed I didn't get to see you guys. I was so excited to go, and then it was just fucked, you know. And that's 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 how it is, man. I'm super bummed that I don't have any great reveals that just deflate the whole history of humanity somehow or art world. <laughs> And on that bombshell. Yeah. Well, congrats on the new record. What is it? Number 19, right? 19th record? Something. But we've got another one hot on its heels. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. It's even better. Even better? This one's great, man. This one's really much better. Uh, You know, a long time ago, I picked up on, I I personally, even though there's two different versions of Rubber Soul and Revolver, you know, there's, to me, those are great Beatles records, right? But the thing is, is all the songs aren't great. They didn't even try. Some of the singles around the same time are fucking fantastic. And the songs from the singles aren't on the record. You know what I mean? 
like rain is a great one you know there's all these tracks right that aren't on the records and they kind of i figured out when i was young that they just did it to give you a breather so you could really tell the difference between a good song oh because if you had all just slamming songs nobody could tell the difference it's just music at a certain point yeah have a couple clunkers in there and then be like oh oh my god but, but they're not clunk- clunkers they're just songs you know yeah I mean? right 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 let's let let's let ringo sing one or whatever it was right and so the the, the first record I, I just sort of grouped some songs that i thought fit together i didn't out of the like 70 songs that I could have like finished up or mixed or whatever, I didn't go these by, by, you know, we've, we've surveyed all my friends and consulted the comments and the YouTubes and whatever it is. Right. So these are the best songs, you know, in this slam in order. I didn't really consider it that way. I was like, this makes a good record and a good, I want to get these songs out into the air. And the other ones I was just like, I love all these songs so i'll just put these ones together right here in a, in a way that i thought was they were both to be good records but as i was mixing them and listening back it was like wow this other record is just really really very very good <laughs> oh, fuck. and um so i'm very interested to see how that plays out in the perceptions of people yeah because uh everything i think is bullshit. i mean ultimately people make up their own minds the, the interesting thing is like the first time we ever had a practice, I made up six songs and all of those songs ended up on records and all those songs still sound timeless. They don't really sound like, oh, this is 1990 or some some crap where it's rooted that way. Like we could just slip it into the set and nobody would say anything. Not that they would be like, oh, my God, I can't believe they're playing this like really obscure old song. It's just it wouldn't be out of place. It wouldn't sound like a band was out of place or that the songwriting wasn't developed enough or something, you know, like something was not quite there. Right. Which is that that's another kind of power in music. That's, I think it's even more important than weird things, you know, like uh, one of my friend's bands had a like number one hit out of the gate, you know, but every time I hear it, I just think of this like fucking sixties organ song that they lifted the whole thing. from. <laughs> I mean, their song is great. But, you know, I, I, all I can hear is the original song because English bands are so into that. They're like, oh, this is so great. It doesn't matter. Creep is like, all I need is the air that I breathe. They all do that. You know, they're like, this this thing is so great. I'm going to become it, you know? Oasis. You know? Exactly. But they're so unlike the Beatles. It's phenomenal. The only thing that's like them is that, that those B chords that you learn in a Beatles song book it's like why the fuck is he playing this chord that nobody plays because the beatles were using it's all detuned you know half step yeah. and then so the guy tried to transpose it you know on the piano like to do the tablature and then, so he's playing all these funky b chords <laughs> and so it's this chord that nobody would ever play on guitar except everybody who learns that way has to learn this really bizarre b chord and then you listen to somebody like Elliot Smith and you're like, of course you'd learned how to play a guitar from a Beatles songbook because only those people play that chord in the whole history of mankind because it's not a chord that you would ever play. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I, I got to tell you the artwork too, on all the records have been phenomenal over the years. I mean, just, I just love the album covers, man. I'm trying to get weirder. Yeah. yeah I'm on my, I'm on my, I've been having a battle about the next one. And I think I won, so I'm going to get weirder. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, man, it was fantastic talking to you. And uh, like I said, your music is uh, was a big soundtrack of my life in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, to me, Brian Jonestown is a lot like craft work. I'm always telling people, man, you listen to this, you know, you got to hear this. You got to listen to this. Wolfgang loves craft work. My son's he's a baby. Great. We love that shit. Yeah. Great. Great. We're in the land of craft, but yeah, you are. Absolutely. Well, uh, June 24th, new record comes out and then the UK and Europe tour. And congrats on getting your gear back. Congrats on playing music most of your life and uh and doing art. And uh you never had a job, right? Well, you know, I've done some funky things. Yeah. Um, when I moved to San Francisco. I was sort of tricky, you know, like I thought, well, maybe I'll go just 
do something clean, like walk into these restaurants and get a job as a busboy or something. It's a nice place. And it's just like, yeah, like every gay young man in the world walks into San Francisco. To make, you know, you, it's, it's a tough room to crack into. They're not, there's no way you're going to get a job as a busboy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Unless you got mad skills, right? Because they just hire and fire people all day long. Um, and they're really persnickety people. But um, so, you know, me and my friends, we got on this tip of, we knew this guy who was, he was almost like slumming, but his family owns Walgreens. But anyways, he gave us this tip of the jobs line at San Francisco State. So we would start calling these numbers just to get throwaway jobs, you know, and I would go into, I'd get these weird jobs. Like one, I used to work um, for a while, just delivering brand new cars, picking them up and delivering brand new, like high-end cars for this credit union. So all these executives for Pac Bell would go, I want an Acura. So I'd get on the bar and run out to Livermore and pick up a car from fleet sales and come zipping in at like hundred miles an hour across all those bridges going like a hundred. It'd be smoking. And I would, I would have Range Rovers overnight, you know, and just, I'd only have to be there, you know, at the morning and it's clean and it was fine. So I'd be driving around with my mates. So I was doing that. And then I got this other one where I was doing a uh, data entry, data edit for this um, company, EH White, and they were doing like transportation mapping of where every they were tracking like 80,000 people in the Bay Area, all their movements for one day, three days, five days, or two weeks, and the mode of transportation. So you're like, I walked from my house to the bus stop, I went on the bus, got there, and then I walked to work. And then you did list the times, and it could be cars or trams and i was really good at it like most people would be fucking around for the money this is really good money because you're just cold calling people or whatever you, first there's like one group of people getting people to submit to doing this to you know improve transportation get bigger budgets from the government so and then there's people that are trying to get these people to mail their travel diaries and all that stuff and then there's people that are writing down all this because it used to be based on the these uh thomas guy postal subdivision numbers, right? So you'd be like, it ult ultimately end up in, as data. So it's like, you're going to 9635 to 18047, you know, or whatever, right? And um, because of my mind, I could just pick out everybody who's just writing down random numbers. <laughs> like, there's no way that's possible, right? Like there's nonstop, you know? Ah. So they just, so they just kept, they kept letting people go as the, this, this, because this was a months long, massive project. They keep saying, well, we don't need telephone solicitors anymore. Okay. We don't need people to do that data edit this, you know, and I went straight into, I mean, data entry. I went straight into editing, correcting all everybody's Mickey Mouse stuff and working overtime and stuff. And I was just cleaning up money. It was just like, I never made so much money in my life, wow. you know? Yeah. Where you're just, where you're just like a kid screwing around with 250 Two hundred and fifty-seven dollar rent, and you're making like, oh yeah, thirty-seven hundred, thirty-seven hundred a week, just correcting people's computer mistakes because they're just trying to fuck off the clock. You know? wow. <laughs> like, and you're eating like the three dollar burritos. It was I, we we were we, me and my friend David were seriously walking across the street and going to the all you can eat salad bar at Carl's Jr. filling up w once one time a day for like three dollars and fifty cents, and we were just cleaning up cash like ah. by the bucket load. Cause, and because we did not even care. We we're like, hey, I'll work a double. Like I'll work, I'll work 12, 15 hours. I don't care. Just like, yeah, you know, I don't make any mistakes. I don't care. And they were just like, oh, you're so cool. You know, that's great. We're gonna move you to the next office. We're shutting this one down. Cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. Don't care. yeah. Yeah. Because it was just like phenomenal. But you know, to some of these jobs that come in there and they're like, you're a little bit old for college or whatever. And I'd be like, oh, I'm in film school at SF State. It's like make something up, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't yeah. care. Oh my like, god, that's great. But I never had a serious job. Yeah, just yeah. just out of necessity because I wouldn't go on welfare or deal drugs, basically. Yeah. Well, oh that's thing. that's a win, man. Doing art your whole life, dude. Yeah. Yep. Congrats, and uh, great to talk to you. And you? I can't wait to hopefully get to say I have not seen you play since the nineties. And uh, it's way too long. Well, you got to play that lotto and get your ass over to Amsterdam or one of these big shows. Paris. I wouldn't mind seeing that, actually. You know, Paris I'm going to look at the, the schedule hook. and maybe just fucking boogie out and go see ya. No, you. No, see, it doesn't work that way. Because, like, uh, for instance, yesterday the tickets went on sale. Yeah. So, like, 
our London show sold like 450. We don't use advertising. So they, we sold like 450 the first day of like a bunch of these shows. Wow. So the rooms aren't that. And if you think about um, some of these shows are like in January, right? Yeah. There's no way in hell there'll be tickets. Like wow. we're talking like no one we sell, sell out like uh, sell out um, in hours. But the thing is, is, um, you know, I don't know how honest everybody is, but people are eating shit right now because of inflation and gas and all that stuff. That's that's the truth. I mean, everybody's everybody's Facebook profile or whatever looks great. <laughs> you know, but, it's all shiny. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean. Forever, <laughs> right? They're catfishing each other. But but the reality is, a lot of people are really uh, hating life and money uh, over money. And also, there's a lot of these shows. You know, it's like Mick Jagger just canceled his show because he got COVID. So he just canceled that whole and you know, however many shows he's going to cancel because he's older. He just canceled that show and he's like, sorry, um, everybody at this stadium in Amsterdam, whatever, you know? Yeah. We're going to reschedule everything. Well, think about how many Stones fans in this stadium booked. They're like, no, I'm going to Amsterdam. Flights, hotels, trains from everywhere else. It's not just the good people of Amsterdam going to see Stones. People travel, destination. Brazil, everywhere, you know? People are like, Dude, it's 150 years old, and I'm never going to see, see these guys again. But they're not going to give any refund in your base tickets. He just says, we're going to reschedule. So there's people that are sitting, because of COVID times and all the cancellations, that are sitting on four tickets right now because right. certain venues don't even refund. Yeah. That's that's mad. So there's a lot of people like, oh, they can't get into it that deep. Yep. Yeah. Well, man, it's a, it's definitely a tough time of touring, and that is 100%. I mean, I tour non-stop and it's just yeah. like you know one wrong move you're sick and you're down thousands yeah i was I to, but think about it. i i, I rent buses so i rent all that stuff we have 12 people in the traveling party plus the driver right and we caught covid and i had it's hotels for everybody plane tickets for the people you got to separate everybody Fuck. as as they're, as they're coming down with it and then you got to stay for a minimum of five days you're out yeah. of action you know yeah. so it, it gets pricey that's what happened to us on tour you know i know yeah i mean oh, whatever it, it, you just lose crazy money it's all right whatever yep i hear Only money man oh yeah <laughs> i'm not i'm not worried about the money i just uh I, I, i'm more i'm more worried about being able to keep doing it is what i'm worried yeah about. i lost less money than all them fools on bitcoin oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i fucking love you on that you're right <laughs> all right man all right Good talking to you, man. Thanks. Keep rocking, brother. Cheers. See ya.